Well, you know, I sure miss Doug uh, being here to wheel this out. As you can see, I am not a trained professional uh, on how to uh, set this up, so I apologize uh, for that. But uh, just let me say it's good to, good to have you here today. Uh, and we are on our second week uh, in this series, I Love My Church. And today, uh, we are serve. We're talking about serving. So I wore my serve shirt today to hopefully you can see that. Uh, so let me start off today with this story. During World War II, bombs fell in the area of a small village that had a statue of Jesus. And the statue was broken into several pieces due to the bombings. After the war, the citizens of, the, of that little village decided to rebuild this statue. And they searched for the pieces and they found them all, all except for the hands. And I think this is the picture of that statue. They pieced it back together. Now, some people suggested they would build a new statue since the hands could not be found. And after much discussion, the people in that little village decided to keep this handless statue, and they wrote these words at the base of that statue. It says, I have no hands but your hands to do my work today. I have no feet but your feet to lead men on their way. I have no tongue but your tongue to tell men how I died. I have no help but your help to bring men to God's side. And I love that little story because it reminds me the call that is upon each one of us as a Christ follower. You see, we are called, all called, to go and to work, to help, to love, to speak. We are all called as Christ followers to go and serve him. Paul said it like this, for we are God's, what? Workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In that verse, Paul reminds us that God fashioned each of us in a certain way so that we could do what for him? That we could give back what to him? That we could produce good works. You see, believe it or not, God has called you as a follower of Christ to work or to serve alongside him in this world. Notice that in that verse, Paul lists no restrictions uh, on serving. There are no parameters. It does, you don't have to be a certain height. You don't have to be a certain weight. You don't have to come from a certain place. Uh, it doesn't matter your age. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're retired. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Everybody is called to go and serve. God created you. God designed you. God fashioned you to do this one thing is to serve him. You see, God made you to contribute in this world, in his kingdom. God made you to make a difference in his kingdom. God made you to give something back. It's like Mark said in, his, in the devotion, God's love for us. Man, when somebody does something nice for you, what do you want to do? You just want to go and give back, don't you? He, he never expected you to sit on what he gave you. How ridiculous would it be for Coach Cow to recruit a guy that in high school had 20 rebounds and this guy comes to UK and he gets one or two rebounds. He's sitting on what he was created to do, right? In the same way, that's how it is with us. Why would God invest so much in you? Why would God put a gift, uh, an ability, a talent in your life and just, and just for you to sit on it? That doesn't make sense, does it? The Bible tells us that much. The Bible tells us it doesn't make sense to sit on your gift. You remember the parable of the talents? How did the master view the one who went out and just buried and hid his talent? Do you remember? Let me, let me remind you, it was not a, a good outcome for that guy. The master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Basically, he, if you read that parable, what was well, his one gift that he had, it was taken from him and given to somebody else. And so it was not a good, good reply from the master. Then on the other hand, how did the master view the other two who used their talents? The one that had been given two, the one that had been given five. He said this, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And he says, come, uh, and because you have been faithful, come and share in the master's happiness. So again, God created you, he fashioned you, he gifted you, he equipped you with certain talents and abilities all so you could do one thing. And that's use them for his glory. Use them for his glory. Each one of you, Peter said, uh, should use whatever gift he's received to what? To serve. 
It doesn't say that uh, somebody doesn't have a gift because everyone has been gifted by God. Everyone has been given a talent. It may be one talent. It may be five talents, but you've been given something. And Peter reminds us that each one should use whatever gift you've been given to serve. So let me ask you this morning, are you doing that? Are you using what God gave you? Are you using those gifts and those talents and abilities that God gave you to serve him? to serve others, to give back to him because of what he's done for you. And this, let me say, we cannot earn our salvation. In what we do, it's not about uh, getting more favor with God, but it's about giving back to him because of what he's done for us. I just naturally want to do that. And so I want to highlight one group of people that, uh, that, I, that I love. When it, this title of the sermon is, I love my church. And one of the main reasons that I love my church is when I see people using their gifts, using their talents and abilities to serve others. And it doesn't ma matter how big this gift is or how small the gift is. What matters is that they use their gift and they're excited about using this gift. And so I want to share with you one such group and uh, here at the church that make me smile because they use their gifts to serve around this place. They're called the chefs in Christ. Johnny, would you come on up here? I call them Johnny affectionately, but the chefs in Christ have been, uh, have been around here for the last seven years. So if you've been here for the last seven years, then you certainly have uh, benefited from their, uh, from their gift and their talent or ability. And I am so glad uh, that they have that talent and they love to use that talent because it revolves around food, amen? We, we love that. So if you've been around here, you guys have served with uh, several different things. Uh, certainly our homecoming that we've had every year, um, you guys cook for that. Uh, you guys cook for Ironman every week. Um, and I'm just thrilled you cook for community events, you cook for, cook for children's events. So we've all benefited. If you've benefited and if you've eaten the meal from the chefs in Christ, raise your hand. All right, we use them a whole lot around here. Well, this is their fearless leader, John Ward. And uh, as I said, I affectionately call him Johnny. So John, in preparing this message, I uh, immediately thought of you guys. I uh, thought of what you guys do, just not just uh, once a week, but th all throughout the year. And so I would like you to be able to share with the congregation, first of all, how did uh, the chefs get started? Well, Craig told me to keep it short. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, we started at Southland. Whit Griswold was, the senior, was our minister of men's ministry. And Whit had left to go to uh, Northeast to take that position over there. <clears throat> Gary Graham and myself took over men's ministry as lay leaders. And we had made a calendar up and we took it to Mike Rowe, which was the new senior minister. Yeah. And he went over and he said he looked fine, but he said, I want to start a men's breakfast. Whoa. <laughs> we didn't know anything about cooking. We didn't know anything. But that's when Chefs in Christ was started. We met at the barn back in the back of South at the, at the campus there. And we had some 150 men show up the first weekend. Well, Mike was speaking. I spoke the first couple of years, and uh, needless to say, they didn't get much to eat that weekend. <laughs> but uh, we kept growing, and we kept making our own equipment, uh, and we bought equipment and stuff, and then uh, finally it developed to what you see now. We used to do a lot of catering, but we don't do that anymore. But anyway, that was where it started when Mike said we want to have a men's breakfast. So that was back in uh, 96, 97. Mike came in 96. That's when I came to Southland as well. But uh, so for the last 23 years, you guys have served. And so talk about the uh, events. It's not just here at Broadway, but how many uh, engagements, how many uh, times do you serve in other places? Well, <clears throat> right now we don't really go anywhere else except here at Broadway. Our age group has gotten uh, older. Tell. <laughs> uh, but uh, we just don't have the youth anymore to go out and set up and cook for other events. We used to do quite a bit of catering. Mm -hmm. But now we just kind of focus here and we support 
the children's ministry and the other things that Craig and them want, we like to support. Uh, a little bit about the finances here is that we charge for certain events, but then we turn around and give that back to children's ministry for whatever ministry needs yeah. help. We do it free because yeah. we've already received some money uh, in advance of it. So your money goes for do dual purposes. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think that over the years uh, that, uh, that you've been here, I mean, we were together at Southam, but that you've been here, um, I think there's been one time where you haven't been able to cook. And so, I mean, they have such a willing heart to use their gifts, and that's what I love. So how many are on your uh, team as far as uh, total chefs? Right now we have about 20 extra, 20 members, active members. We have two ladies, which we, two years ago, we... Uh, opened it up to ladies, and we have two chefettes, they're called chefettes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they love to bake, so a lot of these goodies that you get sometimes, choir retreat and stuff, have come from at least one of the ladies, uh, and she loves it. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, uh, no, that's good. Let me ask you this, okay, because this is, this is really good. Um, 23 years... And I don't know that you can tell me how many people are still with you that were there tw at the start, but I would say quite a bit. But 23 years of serving together, how have you guys grown in your relationship because you serve together? Well, we actually have three members that have been with the group. So, uh, and that's pretty good over that many years because we've uh, had them come and go and, and that's it. But uh, the question of serving together is uh, it has drawn me closer to God. The greatest thing so far is to understand who Christ is in me, and I live in him, and he lives in me. You know, we try to pray before every event. I would ask the group who would like to pray out loud and tell them it is an honor, not a punishment, mm. to talk to the Father. Mm. From, that many guy, from that, many of the guys have grown comfortable to pray out loud. I'm so pleased with our men and women that they had developed into leaders of the church. We now have elders, deacons, lay ministers, and just good men and women yeah. of God. It is really nice to see the growth that has taken place in all these chefs. In the past few years, I have realized that I have some great chefs that I'm working with. Yeah. Now we work and share stories and with each other and share love of God. We also carry yeah. each other's burdens in our prayers. Yeah. We enjoy showing the love of Christ to the people that we serve. To watch this group move to another level is amazing. We are growing in Christ together. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, would you give John a hand for what he does? And I hope you heard that last part specifically because that's kind of the point I want to make today is that by serving together, I think you could ask each of the uh, chefs that, that serve, and I think they would say the same thing. There is nothing more fulfilling than you unselfishly serving other people and doing it with people you love. Now let that sink in. You see, that's a byproduct of, of serving together. You automatically grow closer together. You become a family. You become a special community. You do life together. And that's what we want for every single person who calls this place home. We want you to find a place to serve alongside others and grow in a relationship with each other. And so let me ask you, have you found that place to serve? Have you found that community here? If so, great. But if not, then why? My question to you lovingly is why? What is stopping you from serving? What is stopping you from using the gift that God has given you? Uh, let me try and guess maybe what uh, might be stopping you. Number one is this. Is it time for you? Is it a thing of time? Are you too busy? Do you have too many irons in the fire, as my mom used to say? I think for a lot of people, this reason right here keeps them from serving. They're, they're too busy. Uh, sometimes we let the urgent things get in the way of the most important things, and that's life for every one of us at times. But that busyness, that busyness, Martha and Mary, you remember Martha was busy. 
Mary was listening. Busyness is the number one killer of compassion. It just, it, the two doesn't go together. They won't go together. You can be busy too. You can be busy too, hear me, with the church things that you're doing. We've talked about this before here. You can be overwhelmed and be serving too much. So you gotta, you gotta look at what you're doing. But serve. Don't let time get in the way because when you let time get in the way of you serving, you're missing out on a blessing. Maybe for you, is it selfishness? I don't think anyone would like to admit that, but certainly that is one hurdle that keeps us from serving. I love the way the message paraphrase quotes Philippians 2.4. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Uh, you know, I fully believe that God gives us opportunities to serve him. The problem is we just can't forget about ourselves, can we? Our own agenda, the things that we want to do, and we end up missing out on opportunities to serve him. And, and as we look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, wasn't that the problem with the priest and the Levite? If you read that, that passage later, they each saw the man lying there, beaten, needing help. They saw him, but they passed by. Why? Because they were too busy and they were concerned about their own agenda. They had to go and do what they had to do. As we look at Jesus' life, that's one thing that I see from Jesus. He was never too busy, never too self-centered to miss out on opportunities to serve. We, we see this from his life in many, many times that he was always ready and willing to stop and to help somebody. One such instance is this one. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus, what did he do? He stopped and he called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. And look, Jesus had compassion on them and he touched them, touched their eyes. When was the last time these guys had been touched? And immediately they received their sight and followed him. So don't miss, as you look through the New Testament, read the stories about Jesus' life, that he had the opportunities and he took advantage of the opportunities that were provided for him to serve others. He took the time to stop. He took the time to be interrupted. Now, the question is, do I? Am I that way? Are you that way? Jesus understood life was about serving others. His life, specifically, was about serving others. Do you realize that? He said this about himself. He says, just as the son of man did not come to be served, if anybody should have been served, it would have been Jesus. But he said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So I'm so glad to tell you another reason I love my church is when I see this selfless love take place and people serve uh, unselfishly in their lives. And they put the needs of others before their own needs. And I see this happen all the time here at Broadway. I see somebody like last week, our executive minister, Doug Pye, we had a man here that needed a, a bus pass. So Doug takes time out of his Sunday afternoon after being here early, after working all week, he takes this guy to the bus station uh, and he had, to, he had to go somewhere else with this guy. And I just love to see that. Doug has that servant heart. I see a guy like a Bob Davenport that takes the time out of his Sunday afternoons or sometime during the week and he takes communion to Morning Point for Bob Turley. Uh, I see somebody like Jerry Case that goes over and spends so much time at Sayer Village. Uh, I, I see those that drive in our van ministry, sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes three times a month, some of our van drivers drive to pick up people that need a ride, that can't drive anymore, and they wouldn't be able to come here if they didn't do that. I see a guy like Steve Kineth who comes when it rains. You know how it floods downstairs. Steve Kineth sometimes comes and sets up the sandbags on the Sonia doors by himself. Sometimes he comes by himself and he takes those sandbags down afterwards. He's serving. Now, there are plenty of more people that I could serve, and if, I'm, if you're one of them, I'm not trying to overlook you. I appreciate what you do, and thank you for what you do. Because you selflessly give. You use your gift to serve. The problem is that a lot of these people that I've mentioned, they're already doing other things too. They're already overloaded with some other things. They could use some help. They really don't need one more thing on their plate, but they continue to do it because it needs to be done. So I'm asking you, 
Will you put your agenda aside to help serve? Will you selflessly serve in the place, this place, that you call home? Because we need you. And we're going to need you on August 4th. The other thing, maybe a hurdle for you, is it perfectionism for you? You think that you can't serve because you're not perfect. Now, I'm all for excellence in ministry, but I, I think we need to strive certainly to give our best. I think the Apostle Paul talked about this. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Certainly when we, uh, it ups the ante, doesn't it, when we're serving for, for God. And so I, I'm all about that. But um, maybe you're of the belief that say, if you can't do it first class, then don't even try. I, I don't know about that. I, I, don't, I don't particularly like that. I'm so glad though, as we look through scripture, that we don't see a bunch of people who are perfect that serve God perfectly. In fact, we see some of the greatest of all times, uh, people that we have Bible lessons from a youth on, we see where just the opposite is true. When you look at a Abraham's life, when you look at a Jacob's life, when you look at a Moses or a Samson or a Peter or a Paul, what do you see from their life? You don't see perfection. You see mess ups. You see screw ups, right? They're not perfect. I don't know who said it, but I love this quote. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And we've seen that in, in, in the book of Acts. Do you remember what the leaders said of Peter and John when they saw them? Look, it says this. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So church realized we don't have to serve perfectly for God to bless our efforts. God doesn't use perfect people because there aren't any perfect people. I want you to turn to the person sitting beside you and just tell them, you're not perfect. <laughs> now, some of you did that with too much enthusiasm, all right? But let me explain my point. Do you remember, do you remember when a... Uh, when your children would draw you something or your grandchildren would draw you a picture? Uh, you remember uh, how, how you felt? Uh, Kelly's little daughter, Eliana, drew me this picture. And uh, I wasn't here, but I was on my door. I think she drew each person in the, on the staff a picture. But, you know, when Emmy or, or, or Tate or Elijah uh, or colors me a picture, when Kayla and Ann colored me a picture, when your kids, grandkids colored you a picture, um, what did you say to them? And you were thrilled, weren't you? Uh, when they gave it to you, you, you wouldn't say this. Man, I can't believe you colored outside the lines. What's your problem? All right? Yeah, cows aren't pink. I mean, don't you know that? We've been to the farm before. Now, I doubt that any of you said that. And if you did say something like that, I want to talk to you after service. Because <laughs> you've got a problem. All right? But I bet that you said more something like this. Oh, man, that's amazing. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. I love it. And don't you think that's what God does when we just give to him from our heart? We just willingly lay down and just serve him. Don't you think it makes God smile? I don't think he, he says you didn't do it perfect. He's thrilled with what we've given him. Now, there are other barriers that come with serving. Uh, I listed three. Certainly, we could list a lot more, couldn't we? But here's the truth, church. We, we, need, we need you to serve. If you're not serving in an area, we need you to step up. We need workers. Jesus says this, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You see, reaching our world for Christ. It's a group effort. It's a group effort. It's all of us working together. Paul said this, now the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts and though all parts are many, they form one body. 
And this verse really hit home to me about 15 years ago. I uh, was playing basketball. Somebody undercut me. I fell and, tried, and broke my wrist, my right wrist, which I'm right-handed. So if you've ever had that experience and broken uh, uh, one of your hands that you use, uh, it's, it's tough. I was in a cast for seven weeks. Needless to say, it was not a lot of fun. Uh, it hindered me from doing a, a lot of things. I wasn't able to function the way I was supposed to because a key part of my body was not working properly. Do you see the comparison I'm trying to make? If some of us are working and others are not, it affects the body. It affects what we're able to do. It limits us to what God wants to do in this place. So in roughly three weeks, we're going to have to, we're going to be having both services starting simultaneously. It's a new thing for Broadway. We're going to be in need of more people to serve in both places in many different areas. We're going to need new people to step up and to serve. People who are currently not serving. That's who I'm trying to target here today. If you're serving, praise God. But if you're not serving, I want to pull you in. All right, here's some areas that you can uh, easily get involved in. We need new greeters. We need more greeters. Uh, host, welcome center, uh, see Mark Dunn, see Brenda, tech team, see Dave. We need somebody to run slides, somebody to help with the lights, somebody to help with staging. Just so, uh, so you don't want me up here knocking over guitars, somebody could just roll this out would be great. So Doug doesn't have to do it all the time. Uh, children's ministry too, though, is always needing help. Nursery workers, worship leaders, teachers, uh, just people to help with check-in. So there's plenty of areas those are just some of the areas. So I'm asking, I'm asking you, our leadership is asking you for help. I'm asking you to take a chance to step out in faith and start using a gift that God has given you. Maybe it's a gift you don't even know you have until you get involved in this. But God is asking you to do this. He's asking you to throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for just who you are, God. I thank you for placing within each and every person. God, you don't hold back from anybody. You give to us all a specific talent, a specific gift, uh, a heart, God, that beats in a certain way for a certain purpose. And so I pray that we would not just squelch that gift, that we would not just sit on that gift. Whether it's just calling somebody on the phone, who, who can't do that? So I pray that you would move your people today, God, people that call this place home to, to serve, to step up, to step out, and to trust you. The need is great. And God, we do it all for you, not for ourselves, not so we get the credit, but so that you will get the credit, so the kingdom will grow. So thank you for all those that serve diligently around this place. Draw more people to you. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.